Hello, welcome to Academy Unscripted. I'm Sean Stallworth in adult programs at the Academy of Natural Science, and today I'll be talking with Issa Bayancourt, an Academy Entomologist. Hi, Issa, how are you doing today? Hi, Sean, I'm doing well. Good to be here with you today. Before we get into the guts of the conversation, I just got to ask the one question I know everyone's begging to hear. Uh, what does an entomologist do? We study bugs, and the field of entomology when I was going off to study entomology in college, a lot of people were like, wow, that's a really specific thing. And I was thinking the opposite in my head because the insect world has millions of species in it and so many different groups. And so I was like, oh my gosh, what within entomology will I study? There's forensic entomology where you look at crime scenes and look at what life cycle, what life stage an insect might be at. And that, that can be used to determine the time of death. Uh, and then there's agricultural entomology where there's people, scientists who study the different insects that eat plants and how those interactions work to help with farming and food production. The entomologists here look at the different morphologies of the insects and stru the structures, the body structures, and uh, study that and collect insects to create this collection um, where they study this, the tree of life. They're basically organizing the tree of life and seeing how things are connected, describing new species. In what ways does this research make life better for people in the Delaware Valley? So some of the work that I've been working on with our collection at the Academy, we have four million insect specimens and dozens of species of moths and butterflies from um, North America alone. And so having all these specimens and also doing this project currently called the LepiNet, where we're um, imaging and transcribing, digitizing our collections and the information on the labels. Scientists can make maps of where the different moths and butterflies are located in North America, and it enables us to help, help monitor and keep track of the populations and know what's around, and you can't protect what you don't know. And so it's really important for conservation and um, connecting people with nature. What is the most satisfying part of your job, Issa? It is really awesome to be, once again, in the collection where there's so many different specimens. It feels like such an honor to be part of the legacy of generations of people who have been there and working with the collection and putting it all together because it, it's not, it didn't happen overnight, that's for sure. And then also I like to show the specimens and I love it when people get inspired themselves and, and excited about them. You kind of went right into my next question. If someone that is listening is excited by your work, what could they do to get involved? Yeah, um, when I was younger, it was a whole different world. Um, you, couldn't, you couldn't find insect communities online. Like back then I didn't know really, I didn't know other people who liked bugs like I did other than my sister. Um, and so I think one, one thing that's really big is connecting with finding like local groups, um, the local museum where you can really dive into the world of entomology and connect with the um, educators and entomologists. Come to Bug Fest at the Academy of Natural Sciences too. It's one good way to connect and celebrate and find that community. Also just continue to explore in the places that are around you, so your backyard, the flower pot on your front porch. Um, you can find insects anywhere and that's what I love about them. Um, and if you're able to, uh, Keep track of what you see, because um, when you look at a bug, there's so many species out there. There's millions of species that have been documented by scientists and millions more to be discovered. That's why collections are so important, because otherwise we can't keep track of them all. So take pictures, write down notes, try to identify it later if you don't know what it is at the moment. Um, and then you can keep track through posting on bugguide.net, on iNaturalist, on uh, LEPS, send them to us at the Academy. And start an insect collection too. <laughs> that's always, that's, we have some people at the academy that would go bonkers if people start coming in with their insect collections. <laughs> so we're going to get to the root of these causes, the cause of you loving bugs so much. So you're younger and outside in your backyard and stuff like that. Were you looking for bugs then? Yes. You I were? <laughs> yeah. Um, my family took my sister and I to like the local park and we went um, camping for a vacation so we, we were out in nature a good amount and I started to discover bugs and was fascinated by the bugs but then I also learned how little my friends knew or were interested in the bugs and how little the adults in my life knew and I was like what like that like they're so cool and so I, I went on this mission to learn more and to protect them and 
to try to get the word out on how awesome bugs are. Did you have a favorite bug then? Is it the same now? And if it's not, what is it now? I don't know if I had a favorite bug then. Like I definitely liked those caterpillars because they were really soft and fuzzy. <laughs> um, and there was one, my first memory of an insect was with a red admiral butterfly. So that has a really special place in my heart. The funny thing with that story is that we thought it was a friendly butterfly that was um, landing on us in the backyard. Years later, like I go to school, take, take entomology at um, Cornell University where I studied and learned that actually that butterfly was being territorial and trying to get rid of us. It was an angry butterfly trying to scare us away. So it wasn't the friendly relationship I thought it was. But now it's the golden tortoise beetle, which is the fastest color changing arthropod known to man. And it's native and you can find it right in Center City, Philadelphia. And I think that's so cool. It goes from bright, shiny golden to red when it's disturbed. What, what I think is cool about that is I had no idea about that beetle until I talked to you. Now I'm intrigued, like, wow, it can change that, it can change that quickly. You talked about you can find these guys in Philadelphia. Um, what's some of your favorite spots in Philadelphia that you uh, go and look for bugs? Yeah, um, so the first time I discovered the golden tortoise beetle, it was in on the fence of a schoolyard in the Mantua or slash West Philadelphia area. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I still remember seeing it for the first time on a morning glory that was curling up. Um, but since then, uh, I found a whole trove of them over at Payne's Park. So Payne's Park, which is right near the art museum, it's that skate park. There's all this morning glory there where there's tons of golden tortoise beetles every year. So that's one of my favorite spots. And then also I like to collect from Swan Fountain, which is right across the street from the Academy of Natural Sciences. A lot of insects get caught in that fountain. Um, mm -hmm. And I've gotten golden tortoise beetles there, cicadas, katydids, tiger beetles. Um, dung beetles, surprisingly, and all sorts of different critters. Down is something we like to call the lightning round. All right. You ready? Mm -hmm. Favorite bug? Golden tortoise beetle. Least favorite bug? So this wasp that stung me once upon a time, and I don't know why it stung me. It didn't seem like it had a good reason, but that's just one single wasp, not all wasps. Mo yeah. Most misjudged bug. bug. So wa wasps, I'm glad that's a follow-up. The parents, um, if you get too close, will defend their young. And that's what anybody would do. They'd help, they'd protect their young and the, the stinger is the way that the wasps do it. If you were to help out and work in any other department at the Academy for an event or something, what, what department do you think that might be? For me, that would be the exhibits department. Uh, I really like how it's the, the exhibits are like an infusion in a way of the science and also art. Figuring out a way to share Academy science um, in a way that's compelling and engaging for audiences. And I think that's a really cool challenge, an exciting challenge. What is the most wondrous thing about the invertebrate world to you? That there's so much more to discover out there. Like, it's, it's so easy to think like, oh, we already know everything. But the more you learn, the more you dive into it, the more you realize, oh my gosh, like, I might be the first person who ever witnessed this behavior. There's so many insects. There's mi literally millions. And we don't, like it would take many, many lifetimes to get through it all. And more than many, 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 many times a, a million, probably. <laughs> all right, so I, I, wanna, I wanna thank you for joining me um, today for Academy Unscripted. It's uh, really appreciated. Um, thank you, John. It's been this, fun chatting bugs with you. I have a, a couple of questions. You know, I'll wait till the Academy's back open and we're in there, we can talk more. But for now, and I think that's it for Academy Unscripted. I want to say thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. We appreciate you guys for coming. Um, until next time, peace out, guys.